everyone and welcome uh, to this lecture series on Banda 6021-2021. This is the third edition. Uh, the lecture series was uh, set up uh, particular in this year because of uh, the year 1621. It marks a turning point in the colonial conquest of the Banda Islands in Indonesia, which accomplished the principal aim of the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, to establish a monopoly on the valuable sp spice trade in nutmeg and mace. And on May 8th, it will be exactly 400 years ago that Jan Pietersoon Koen ordered the, exec the execution of prominent Bandanese and subsequent raids, which led to the depopulation of the archipelago. Subsequently, the VUC brought in enslaved people from various parts of both Asia and East Africa, including a small part of the previously expelled Bandanese. The Banda Islands served as a precedent for later Atlantic conquests of the Dutch West India Company, or WIC, which was founded in the same year, so in 1621. My name is uh, Nancy Yawa, and I'm part of the working group uh, that has set up this uh, lecture series and is also involved in other um, uh, events related to Banda 6021-2021. Now, I just want to mention the working group members. Um, aside from myself, Wim Anahutu, Pepijn Brandon, Merve Tosun, Matthias van Rossum, Beatrice Glau, and Joella van Dokkersgoed. And I want to give a special shout out to uh, Pepijn Maldon, Beatrice Glau, and Joella van Dokkersgoed for setting up specifically this series. So, as I said, this is the third in a series of uh, lectures and uh, events around uh, Banda. This third round table um, is... Um, specifically focusing on the cultural heritage practices and commemorative practices that are tied to the history of co colonial conquest and international spice trade. We have three wonderful speakers uh, with us. And the first uh, speaker I will introduce to you uh, right now. And by the way, I have to say, uh, because of some technical issues, uh, this uh, particular uh, um, third uh, panel is uh, being recorded in two parts. Uh, so later on you will see another part of our recording, but um, that's uh, why you see a cut uh, somewhere after uh, our first speaker. So I want to now introduce to you our first speaker, uh, which is Ibu Tamalia Ali Shabana from Indonesia, calling in from Jakarta, um, good, uh, um, good evening, uh, Ibu Tamalia. So happy to see you with us. Um, Ibu Tamalia Ali Shabana received her uh, master uh, in law from the uh, Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta and also obtained a law degree from the University of London and her bachelor in law from Trinity College in Cambridge. Um, she's a journalist active as a consultant on matters of cultural heritage, arts and the law. And um, she has published uh, on this uh, um, matter and recently published uh, at the Independent Observer on the Global Change uh, in the commemoration of colonial and other disputed historical figures. If you go to our website, bandaseries2021.wordpress.com, you can also link to her um, present uh, to uh, that particular article that I just mentioned. The floor is yours, Ibu Tamalia Ali Shabana. Thank you. Uh, Ibu Tamalia, can you, uh, because you're still muted, can you unmute yourself? Thanks. So, Thank you, Nancy, for that very kind introduction. And I also want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight about Banda. Now, uh, my background is law. 
and journalism. I, I have no background in history, archaeology, anthropology, or even psychology. So why am I speaking tonight? Well, I've been coming to the Banda Islands since about 1986, and I've been keeping copious notes during those years as I slowly interviewed all sorts of people, including members of the Adat, which you know is the council of um, the ancient customs and traditions that each village has, and repeatedly also interviewing Des Alwi, the last Orankaya of Banda. Now Des knew a lot about the Banda Adat because he was raised in Banda and his maternal grandfather, Kapitan Badila Chong, was also Orankaya of Banda during the late 19th and perhaps early 20th century. That's Des. Now, uh, beside that, I was also appointed Mamali Maluar of Kampung Ratu on Nera uh, in I think around 2009, where I have a, a house, I have a house on Nera. So in this capacity, I've participated in some adat ceremonies and tradition, uh, sorry, So in this capacity, I have participated in some adat uh, ceremonies that are not usually uh, seen by the public. Now, before I begin, let me say that the adat or customary laws and traditions, they're a living thing, so they're not static. And each generation adds something new and sometimes things from older generations are forgotten. However, I believe that there are some very important things that um, have universal value in the Banda Adat, which are connected to the history of the massacre, which should not be forgotten. Now, I will not talk about the massacre itself or the decimation of the Banda population in the 17th century but rather about the aftermath and one of the cultural effects on Banda society of the massacre. Now, Des said that those who survived on Banda were mainly women and children. And later the women approached the VOC to ask if they might continue Banda's ancient customs and traditions. And that's mainly performing the Chakalele war dance or bringing out the war boats for Cora Cora, to which the VOC apparently agreed. Uh, these are the Mama Lima, I think, from my village, Kampung Ratu, if I'm not mistaken, or it might be Negri. Now, um, those survivors would have been very traumatized by the death of so many of their people and the breakup of their society. And they obviously were not in a position to complain or protest. So they put the story of the massacre into the Chakalele dance. This is the dance. The Chakalele is a war dance that you find in many parts of Eastern Indonesia. You find it all over the Malaccas and in the places in Papua and also in Sulawesi where you find this sort of chakalele war dance. And there, as far as I know, it is just a war dance. It's only in the Banda Islands where its function changed to become an instrument for telling the story of the massacre. So let's look at the dance. First, let us look at the dancers. Now, the most important is the central dancer on this photograph. He's wearing the green jacket, and that is the Hulu Balang Tunga, and he represents the chieftain or the Orankaya. Now, this will nearly always be the smallest or shortest of the Chakalele dancers. Not always, but usually. And Des used to tell me that this was because the chieftains were dead and those who survived from chieftains' families were children or very young boys. 
So the hulubalang tanga would have been represented by a child or a young boy. And next we have Kapitan Darat and Kapitan Laut on either side of the Hulubalang, that's commander of the sea forces and commander of the land forces. Um, and then uh, the outermost dancers would be the uh, militia or milici on the left and on the right. Yes. And um, Nearly every village has its own version of the Chakalele dance. They're very similar, but there are differences. Now, not all Chakalele dancers have dances with flowers in their mouth. In this one, they do. And the flowers in the mouth of these dancers symbolizes that the people who survived the massacre were not allowed to speak about it. I think this is perhaps in part what in the past brought an aura of secrecy about many parts of the dance. Now in Banda, you see the Chakalele dancer has a handkerchief tied to each hand. And in Banda, the handkerchiefs carried by the dancers represent the tears that were shed and the sadness for those who departed. From their clothing, you can see that they wore helmets, which were probably influenced by either Portuguese or Dutch helmets from the 16th or 17th centuries. And um, well, on this dance, there's no, also on this photograph, there's no helmet, but I think in the previous photograph there was. And um, later, they, uh, the Bananese even made these sort of helmets. They carved them out of wood. And they have the bird of paradise on them. Uh, now, behind the dancers, usually when they first come out in a row, behind them will be a row of people, about five, um, carrying bamboos. And on these bamboos are bits of cloth tied to them. And these represent the body parts of the 44 orangkaya impaled on bamboos after their beheading and quartering. Now I'll just go back to that picture of the massacre so you can you can see what I mean. There. So you see on the right side, one, two, three, four, five bamboos, and then the cloth and then the heads of the beheaded um, chieftains. Now and Des once explained to me that when he was a small boy, his grandfather, Capitan Badila Chong, told him that when he was a small boy, people said that the bits of cloth on the bamboo poles were still from the original clothing of the 44 chieftains who were beheaded and quartered by the VOC. Now, before the chakalele can be performed, or the Kora Kora uh, may be brought out to sea to compete, a very important Adat ceremony must be performed. Oh, sorry. So these are sort of the bamboos that are carried behind the dancers and later they're planted into the ground when the dancers dance around them. So let me come back. Before that can be done, there's a very important ceremony that needs to be carried out. And that is the Upachara Buka Kampo, or the ceremony to open the village. And what's done is that it sits down and weaves baskets. The baskets are rather similar in each village. And then in these baskets are placed <clears throat> tobacco, lime, beetle, beetle nut, and runners carry them, and flowers, of course. And runners carry them to um, sacred places of each village. So that might be a sacred well or a sacred grave or a mountain that's considered holy, a hill. And there the runner will place the basket and light incense and pray. 
And what's actually happening is that, um, you see, in the olden days, beetle, beetle leaves, tobacco, and that's offered to guests. So what they're doing is they're calling the spirits of the ancestors to come, spirits of the dead. And um, once this has been performed, then um, the, the, the elders of the, of the village, the Mama Lima, the five women, and the uh, Orang Lima, uh, the five uh, men who are the elders, except on uh, Lonto, where it's nine, because they follow the Patal, Pata Siwa tradition of the Molakas, whereas most of Banda follows the Patalima tradition. Um, and they will then all gather here, the Mama Lima, and go into the Adat room where the heirlooms the Adat, are kept. And then this is a closed ceremony and the village waits outside the Adat house. And there the Mama Lima will stand in a row and in front of them, the Orang Lima kneel, and each of them has a coconut flower, but still in its sheath. And then each of the Orang Lima will slice it open and the flower springs out. And then the Mama Lima will together, all together, point the best one. And then everyone will tie little flowers, little birds to this. And um, it becomes the tree of life. This is the Ratu uh, coconut flower that's become the tree of life and on top you see a bird. Now, once this has been done and the tree of life is ready, then they will beat the big drum and then they will bring it out to the village and the whole village will cheer because it means that the old kingdom is back. The spirits of the ancestors are with us. The dead are back. And you see the Kora Kora and the Chakalele belong to the old kingdom. And so now the Chakalele may be performed, the Kora Kora boats may be taken out. And for how long? For as long as the coconut flower has not withered. And I think if that's not, I'm not mistaken, that's about three days. Now, I, I was in London at the time of the Bosnian War. And um, there were a lot of children who were very traumatized by that war, who were sent to London for treatment. And how did they help them? to deal with the trauma. They did so through dance therapy, drama therapy, music therapy, and art therapy. So 400 years ago, these women who were uneducated instinctively knew what they needed to heal their very traumatized society. And you must imagine how comforting it must have been to know that for those three days, all the dead were with them again, all the people they had lost. Now, here you see the Mama Lima standing outside the Adat house. It's not just the Mama Lima, it's also some dancers, um, but mainly it's the Mama Lima. And here is the Hulubalang Tenga, and he is performing the brisomba, so he's paying respect to them. Because before all this can begin, uh, before they start weaving the baskets, permission has to be asked from the Mama Lima to do this. And Des says that that is because it was the women who kept the Adat alive. Now, um, I show you a few. So then, you know, they begin the dance. And 
the dance is in more than one part, yeah? But anyway, here they are dancing around the bamboos, the bamboo poles, which have been planted. Now, um, at the end of the dance, the bamboos are lowered. And that symbolizes the taking down of the body parts which are washed and buried. And then will come the tree of life. They bring out the tree of life, which is to say, what those Bantanese women must have thought and felt and sworn to themselves, we will survive. We will rise again and our culture and our people will survive. So the culture that evolved after the massacre was one that is centered on the search for healing. It's very moving because every time this ceremony is performed, it's as though we were reaching out across 400 years of time to those women, to those brave and wise Bandanese women who wanted to heal their society and to keep it alive. Um, and who created in Banda a culture that centers around healing. So the Chakalele dance is a sacred dance. It, it connects to the ancestors and to the beliefs and to the most important event, the massacre. And it is also a dance of healing. And in a sense, also a dance of triumph because they were not defeated. They were not made to disappear. Um, and, you know, that's why it's a dance that needs to be dealt with carefully. And um, another thing I want to say is that, you know, we see here how belief can also play an important, it, we used to play a very important role in psychological healing at a time when there were no psychologists. Yeah. Anyway, now we are in the 21st century. And last year we saw something very profound happen in the United States when they began tearing down their Confederate statues and the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. And this spread to Europe and even to Indonesia in small parts. It's profound because what we see is a shifting in global values. In the Netherlands, talk began again about the perpetrator of the Banda massacre, Jan Peterson Kuhn, and his statue in the town of Horn, and what should be done about it. Now, in Ambon, there was also a seminar held about this uh, statue uh, and I also wrote an article about it and uh, what I'd like to convey is that the granddaughter of Banda's last Orankaya, Mita Alwi, was asked about this, whether the statue should be torn down and she said that the statue of Kuhn in Horn should not be torn down. Um, because it's history and it tells a story and we cannot change that story. I mean, we cannot change the facts. We can change the story, but we cannot change the facts. Um, she, she said that the statue should be allowed to remain but that the story, look, it has such a large pedestal. That whole pedestal should be, have written on it the story of the massacre and on the sides carved the story of the massacre. And 
the many Moluccan participants at the seminar in Ambon, quite a number of them agreed. And at the seminar, one of the Indonesians mentioned that one of the 44 chieftains or Orangkaya, I think it was Karlan Baka, who was of mixed blood, was the only one to speak out before they were beheaded. He said, gentlemen, have you no compassion? And the speaker of the seminar connected this to George Floyd's last words, I can't breathe, which is another way of saying, have you no compassion? Both were saying, have pity, let me live, I'm human. So what Mita Alwi proposed is that Kuhn's pedestal with the Banda massacre on it, told, carved, and it should also have Karlen Barker's words, and that that should be connected to the 21st century and George Floyd's words, so that never again should there be such a lack of compassion. And that should be the center of the story connected to this statue. It is a statue then that is about never again such a lack of compassion. So it would be a work of art, which I think was created in the 19th century, but that was finished in the 21st century, reflecting the evolving of global values. Never again such a lack of compassion. And then, Banda's culture of healing created by the Mamalimas, the women of Banda, will have prevailed over Kuhn's values of conquest and economic greed. And we will all have participated in developing a world culture of healing and inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tamalia. Um, Ali Shobana, uh, our first speaker uh, for this uh, session. Um, um, and there's already some uh, questions coming in from the chat, but uh, we will first give our speakers the, the floor uh, before we go into a longer discussion. So um, I hope we, you can uh, bear with us. So thank you again, uh, that was really lovely. Um, and I, I really deeply appreciate also your, um, your gendered lens uh, into this uh, story because uh, that's, that's often of course neglected and all the intricacies that, uh, that are brought with um, all these, these rituals uh, that come with commemorative um, aspects and how healing is also an important part of that. Um, and I think it ties beautifully with um, with the talk of our next uh, speaker, um, which is um, Frida Stijlen, um, our speaker from the Netherlands. Uh, Frida Stijlen is an endowed professor of Moluccan migration and culture in a comparative perspective at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the Vrije Universiteit or Free University in Amsterdam. And he's also a senior researcher at uh, the KITLV, K -I -T -L -V, uh, the Royal Insti Institute for uh, Language. Um, uh, and um, I, I never know what the proper English term is, but maybe you can uh, tell us uh, yourself, uh, Fridas. He's working on post colonial migration from Indonesia um, and um, daily life in present day Indonesia decolonization of Indonesia and post-colonial commemoration. So exactly uh, the issue that we're talking about today. Um, someone who hasn't uh, visited Banda yet, but uh, I'm sure very eager to come to Banda. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Pafridis. Thank you, uh, Nancy. Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's the Royal Nenas Institute for Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. Uh, and thank you. So, Ibu uh, Tamalia, I think I was in the in the same seminar on, on JP Kun at, uh, at Unpati, 
uh, and we discussed it. But and, and it's good because I, I I didn't bring pictures, and you showed the the, the statue already, and I want to go into that a little bit later on. And I saw a lot of participants also connected to this this whole whole issue. Um, okay, I'm, I I have never been to um to Banda. That's true, and it's it's still still somewhere at the top of my bucket list. Uh, and I made a promise to my wife that I only will go to Banda when she is able to join me because it's it's a kind of exci exciting place. It's it's like a centripetal place where everybody wants to go to. It's it's some place where uh, a lot of uh, world history is being written, and especially the Dutch colonial history is well. It's a kind of st starting starting point, um, and and therefore it's what I see, for example, among the Moluccan community in the Netherlands. Uh, Banda is a special. It's also a special place. It's it's an anchor in history. Um, it's connected with the uh, emotions. Um, let me tell you about an experience of a, fr a friend of mine. One of my students was accompanying a friend of mine who was going to Banda, and she said, and she, they went by boat. And she said that when they came to to Banda and they were on the boat, he was a kind became very emotional, and he said to uh, my student that. Uh, for him, it was the he was the second one in his family who went to Banda, and it was very special. So there is this, although his family didn't come from Banda but from Saparua, uh, there is this specific connection to this to this place, and I think it has to do with different ways. One, it's of course the special image of Banda, but it also has to do with the the nutmeg, the maize, uh, and the the place of Banda in in the history. It's the moment where. The, uh, the colonial history not started, but really puts its footprints in in the in the history. <clears throat> when you look at the some of the Moluccan wards in the Netherlands, you also find uh, nutmeg referring to this spice trade as part of uh, in in in, uh, in in monuments and in uh, places of commemoration it's because it connects Moluccans from the present day to the to the history, and it says in a way also that. Uh, uh, it's it's also a kind of interaction with the Dutch community to say, you know, we are here in the Netherlands because you were there, you were there because of the spices, and it started partly in uh, in, in Banda. So there's a lot of uh, connection to to Banda if you look at the more <coughs> symbolic uh, symbolic parts. Um, the massacre in Banda committed by Kun, I think it's one of the points that is most uh, vital uh, when it comes to the, the commemoration and the heritage in, among Moluccas in the Netherlands. <laughs> and although, uh, and it's mostly, it's it's presented and talked about in the sense of the massacre and about the uh, the violence by the Dutch, uh, not really discussed but, uh, by the, uh, also the, the part of the Moluccas from other islands that were part of the Establishment by violence of the monopoly on uh, on the spice trade, uh, in co contrary to, for example, the participation of the Moluccans in the as ethnic soldiers in the in the colonial army later in the colonial dis uh, history, uh, where there's a lot of debates on how do you connect the part of the position of the uh, Moluccan former colonial soldiers in the decolonization war, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there, it's it's a kind of that uh, it's, we don't go that that far, but let me go to uh, Jan Peterson Kuhn, uh, the statue that you already showed us, um, and that's one of the places where we can see part of the discussion going on. Um, and I want to, it's it's a, a, a indeed it's a statue that was erected in uh, for his uh, 300 years anniversary of his birthday, birth date in uh, 1887, uh, uh, and in fact it was not a celebration of Kuhn. Uh, well, for the things that he did in, in, in Indonesia or in the archipelago or in Banda, but it was a kind of wave of Dutch nationalism. Uh, so they, they tried to, uh, uh, what is it, to, to underline the, the Dutch nation and they were looking for several uh, figures that could underline this and one of them being Jan Peter Son Kuhn. Um, I want to go to two moments of uh, protest, and then I want to say something about uh, what you raised by uh, 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 whether or not you should keep this statue or not. Um, I think one of the, there are several times there was a discussion about this, Jan Peterson Kuhn, but the first time that Moluccans really uh, were involved in the discussion was in 1987, 
400 years after Kuhn's birth, then the West Fries Museum uh, was celebrating a J.P. Kuhn year. And they asked a uh, Moluccan uh, sculpture uh, artist, Willy uh, Lohi, to uh, put his sculptures in the basement of the museum. When he was putting up his exhibition, then he saw that the, uh, what is it, the, uh, the, the rest of the exhibition was a kind of celebrating young people's own Kuhn. And he felt misused. He said, you're using me as a kind of uh, excuse to celebrate young people's own Kuhn. So he put black uh, cloth on his sculptures as a kind of protest. And while during the opening ceremony, he was uh, of offering a, a black book uh, on the black history of uh, the Moluccans to the then uh, the, the, the husband of the queen who was uh, present at the, uh, at, at the opening. Uh, Willy at that point was dressed up as a chakalila dancer, as a warrior, a Moluccan warrior. So he used the symbol and connection with his grandfather in, and his parents and his ancestry during his, uh, his protest. Uh, of course, you can understand that the director of this uh, museum was kind of uh, angry and he took away the cloths and really later asked to, the cloths to be returned. And as a performing, also performing artist, uh, he wanted to end his protest in, an, in a more performative way. So in December 1988, the last, last full moon, he uh, burned his cloth as a kind of symbolic protest uh, while he was dancing in Chakalila with his ancestors. Uh, it was in, in the midnight, 12 o'clock in one of the um, Moluccan wards. It was a kind of performance of a Chakalila with full moon and with all this uh, I think a lot of the symbols that you talked about, the Malia, uh, was, it was not connected with the massacre of, of Banda, but it was this same kind of strong uh, symbolic in, uh, in, his, uh, in his performance. Um, then the Epikun was kind of forgotten, at least a statue, and it was, there were was some discussions, and I think there are some people in the audience from the museum, and I think they can tell more about that. But recently, and that's where we started this, uh, this seminar at Unpati, the Riepe Kun was again a rally point for, this, for a uh, for protest. And this was a protest organized by Moluccan, Moluccan organizations in the Netherlands uh, in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, so the Black Lives Matter movement kind of uh, revitalized the idea of uh, racism and, they, and decolonization debate. And they organized this, this, this uh, demonstration at the Black Lives, uh, in the context of the Black Lives Movement uh, at the Yepe Kun statue. And their point about Yepe Kun is that what you're doing there is you're celebrating, uh, in fact, you're celebrating a part of the colonial history uh, that we really do not want to have. And you should, the discussion started that should we move this uh, statue or shouldn't we uh, move this statue? Then there's, there's this discussion whether or not the statue is a expression of, uh, of history or that you can use the statue as a point where you can discuss the history, like Nita uh, always says. Um, there's already a small plaque at, at, the, at the bottom of, at the, of, the, of the statue, but the, one of the uh, issues that the Black, com the, the Malacca community in the Netherlands started to raise is that the uh, the statue itself is also a way of expressing and of negotiating and of communicating the uh, the history. Um, the present director of the West Fries Museum, in which the it's in front of this museum is the statue located, uh, describes the statue as a, in in a, in, a, in a video clip. He says it's a statue. It's it's a kind of a powerful statue, and he says it's slightly bent in the back. Uh, so that it leans on his left hand, hind leg, and stands with his chest forward, and therefore appears much more powerful. The statue seems to radiate, don't fuck with Kuhn and the VOC. And I think especially this last power of the statue is the one, is the power that they are protesting against, because it's a kind of repetition and the, the arrogance and the, uh, the dominance of the, of the history that the ancestors of the Molokka community in the Netherlands, so the there uh, from, uh, from Banda, but also from other parts of Maluku, uh, still feel in this statue. So they will discuss and they say, if we, have, uh, if we are rewriting uh, history books or 
uh, why shouldn't we write the history book that's in the public domain? So maybe you should take away this, this figurehead, put it at some other place where we can have more explanation, just not only a plaquette at, at the, the bottom of the, of, the, uh, of, of the statue. So there's a, a discussion that we, we, that they started to, to uh, that they started in order to see how the uh, heritage and commemoration of what happened in in Band, what happened in the beginning of the colonial in the colonial era, can reflect on the way that the Moluccas in the Netherlands, as descendants of the people, or, uh, among others, descendants of the people of Banda, uh, can have a relation with and feel confident about the way how we commemorate and we think in the Netherlands about this uh, this past uh, past history. So I think there is a lot of in that sense, it's in, in this statue of, uh, of, of Kuhn, but also the discussion that we have around this, uh, the heritage and commemoration of what happened to 400 years ago is still a kind of very lively and will keep it on being lively uh, during the, the way that we are dealing with this, this statue, but also with how we in the Netherlands tell the story and the history of what happened in uh, 400 years ago. And I think then I'll make a little shift and I will come to an end for my story, my, my talk. Uh, the discussion and the protests at the statue made it possible, or uh, one of the impacts of the, the following result was uh, that the, uh, the board or, or the direction, direction of the uh, West Fries Museum started to discuss with the Moluccan political activists but also with uh, uh, scholars, Moluccan scholars and non-Moluccan scholars, but how should we represent this, this history of Banda? How should we present this uh, history of the massacre and how can we make a connection to the present day? And that led them to a, uh, a, an exhibition online that's, that will, be, uh, uh, will start next, uh, next month, um, in which they bring all these layers of uh, experiences, but also of perspectives on the on on the history uh, from the pre-colonial time, the pre-FAOC uh, time, because there's longer history than just the FAOC, uh, and then but also the echoes of uh, the the massacre and what happened in Banda uh, until the the present day. And I think that it's it's a kind of a plot to this museum that they will bring these groups together. To, together with the people who are stakeholders, the people who are uh, descendants of uh, the, the people who experienced the, the massacre or who, who, who fled, who, who uh, went to diaspora, um, to create this new story and to make sure that it's continuous and still uh, in, in, an, in, an, uh, in a debate. And <clears throat> I think this is also the way how uh, the heritage and the commemoration of Banda uh, is still alive in the uh, diaspora of Moluccans in, uh, in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frieda Steile, for your contribution, um, where we can see how art can also function as a form of demonstration demonstrating against something which in in itself can maybe also be a form of healing for the people involved uh, but both your presentations also show in a way how um, uh, where you are located matters when you look at these issues eh? and so that I think that's also really interesting just wanted to highlight also when the the statue was um, erected in 1893 in the Netherlands. There was already um, a page-long protest written against the, the statue itself eh, by, I think it was Domela Nieuwhuis, who's seen as one of the founding fathers of the socialist movement of the Netherlands, uh, who was already speaking against, in, in very, in no uncertain terms, I should say also. Um, so, um, many layers to this story. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, 
Last but uh, certainly not least um, is uh, Professor Timo Kaitinen. He is a uh, professor in social and cultural anthropology and here we see the interdisciplinary um, aspect of our uh, session today. The anthropologist is going to speak uh, from the University of Helsinki. Um, I've never been to Finland. I'd love to come one day. He received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago and his research uh, about the language and cultural heritage of the Bandanese diaspora on the K Islands in Malacca was published in 2010 under the title Songs of Travel, Stories of Place, Poetics of Absence in an Eastern Indonesian Society. Beautiful title. Um, Professor Katinen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nancy. That was a generous introduction. Um, I, I, I wanted to continue from a point that emerged from uh, the previous talk by, by Fridus uh, on how, how the history of Banda and the Kuhn massacre continue to be topics which are not neutral. There is still a debate in many places on what is the proper way to talk about them. And this was actually a question that was on my mind when I went to do my own doctoral research in Maluku in the early 1990s, because I uh, was uh, I had been reading up about the history of Banda, and then I was going to a group of people who claimed descent from the original Bandanese, the pre-colonial population of Banda, living in the K Islands, about 400 kilometers southeast from Banda itself. And my question to them was, um, if you have your ancestors have been part of these world historical events. What is your uh, what is your version of those events? What is your version of that history? So I was informed very much by the Dutch historiography of those events, and uh, what I found actually was that the Bandanese did not want to talk about the Kuhn cool massacre in the same terms. It was clearly a very uh, focal event in their own ethnic history. But what I found that they, um, I, I found that they, they were telling the story in an entirely different way uh, through sung poetry, which uh, celebrated their migration away from Banda and the various kinds of relations and networks around the archipelago, which for them seemed to be more important than uh, the event of the Kuhn cool massacre itself. And when they did talk about the Banda history, they emphasized their armed resistance against the Dutch uh, and not, uh, and, and they basically refused to be cast as victims of these events. So when I was thinking about what to say today, I, I thought about two questions. One is, uh, what became the core of my research? How do the Bandanese in the K Islands uh, understand their cultural heritage and how do they connect it to Banda? But also, how does this vision of heritage translate into cultural heritage practices as understood in the current legal and political situation? And um, so I'd, um, I'd like to uh, start to talk, talk with um, a couple of pictures that exp explain where my field site is. Can you see this um, shared screen? Yes. Yeah. So. Um, I'm showing a map of Maluku and uh, you can see Banda here and, and the K Islands here. And between those islands is, is a string of islands along which uh, the, uh, presumably the, the ancestors uh, who founded the villages of Banda Elat and Banda Eli in the Great K Island came to K. And my argument has been that they maintained this connection, that they went back to Banda, they went back to other places in Eastern Maluku to continue the trade relations which preceded uh, the, the spice trade boom in Banda itself. And here's uh, uh, another map where you can see the location of those villages in the K Islands. Great K is about 80 kilometers long. And this is one of the two Bandanese settlements called Banda Elat, and uh, here at the northern side, you have Banda Eli. And it's already known that uh, they were already known uh, to be there in the, uh, in the 1640s. So clearly they, uh, were, the, uh, they were contemporary settlements to, uh, to the Banda history. And this is how the, the village looks 
uh, like uh, today. Um, and I was always advised to go to this village to find Bandanese culture in its most traditional form. Uh, this advice, uh, which I got from local academics and also community members, was in line with how Indonesians thought about cultural heritage in the 1990s. Um, during the Suharto years, cultural heritage was located in places of origin and centers of community life, uh, such as this village. And people who had experienced modernity, uh, for instance, the Banda Eli, people who had gone to the city to seek education, civil service employment, or construction work and uh, trade opportunities, they always expressed nostalgia towards uh, this place of origin. Um, but when I studied uh, the traditions in the village itself, I found that they were not so nostalgic towards uh, their own tradition or to Banda because it was part of their lived life. Uh, they had an active role in various verbal arts, cultural performances and crafts that constitute heritage in the material sense. Old people were still able to perform traditional songs called Onotani and they continued to make metal jewelry um, um, and earthen pots that had value as cultural objects. These metal objects are, uh, they, they count as traditional wealth in the K Islands, but they are in fact made in the village of Banda Eli. And many other uh, cultural objects, which are also part of the contemporary life, uh, do have a cultural value, which is recognized in other places. So it's partly with reference to such objects that people are also able to assert ancestral connections between different ethnic groups. And the people of Pandali, in fact, did so in order to get land in the city of Ambon. Um, and uh, the song, uh, songs called Onotani, which are uh, sung, which were sung by by uh, ladies such as the, those in these pictures. Um, it comes from the root word tang, which means to weep. One possible interpretation is that the people singing them are sad about the loss of their homeland in Banda. But this is not the whole story. Most often the songs start talking about the Bandanese ancestors as heroes who explore unknown islands and perform the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. The prevailing feeling of the songs is not nostalgia about what was left behind, but the pride of sailors who come to strange lands and find that their reputation has traveled ahead of them. The point of sadness uh, in singing these songs is contemporary people who have left their village and not come back. Numerous people I talked to had a father or husband who had lived elsewhere to work or study or pursue a government career for a long time. And when the singers tell about heroic ancestors, they are implicitly comparing them to the contemporary relatives who are missed in the village. In this way, longing and sadness that is part of today's everyday experience becomes connected to the Bandanese cultural heritage. The Banda homeland, uh, in other words, is a meaningful part of everyday experience. But I have argued uh, in studying these songs that uh, uh, they are not only a way of commemorating the past. They are also an expression of the cultural value of long distance movement that explains the remarkable ability of the Bandanese to join modern commercial and political life and to move to cities and towns to work and pursue higher education. Most Onotani start by addressing an ancestor whose name has been passed on in the family. These songs unfold as a narrative in which the hidden meaning of such personal names and relationships is revealed when the story's character sails to distant lands. This pursuit of self-knowledge is an impulse to travel and gain knowledge about oneself. Banda, of course, is an important source of such knowledge. It stands for shared cultural identity, and it is the place where the Bandan is subjected to Islam. In practice, it was impossible for anyone to claim ownership of Onotani songs because they only had value to those people who could tell what it meant. Interpretive agency, the ability to explain the meaning of tradition, was limited to the people who held chiefly positions or high status in the village community. Urban students I knew would go to stay with their village relatives to study their tradition and perhaps write a university thesis about it. 
Even in the 1990s, however, the cultural authorities of the Banda community stressed that they had a specific relationship to the Banda Islands. They were not asking for land rights or aiming to move back to Banda. I know just two individuals from Banda Eli who today reside in the Banda Islands. One went there as a civil servant and he is now the director of the local education department. Another married the daughter of a nutmeg farmer and joined his in-laws in Great Banda. What the Banda Eli elders are saying is that their origin in Banda precedes the social and political order created by colonialism and any valid history of Banda should recognize their ancestors as political actors in the 17th century. Of course, uh, this is often uh, something that is, uh, that is not observed. Many accounts of Banda uh, tell us that uh, the original population of Banda was simply wiped out. And this is a claim that makes uh, the, the Banda Eli community very, very angry. Um, but uh, in the 1990s, what I found is uh, that these claims about Banda uh, and ancestry mainly arose in inter-ethnic encounters with other groups in Maluku and occasionally spilled out to the local history scholarship and debate. In other words, it was mostly a cultural question. And uh, two decades later, it seems that the situation has profoundly changed. The heritage status of Banda is more than a cultural or academic question, and the legal and political environment in which this heritage is defined has been transformed by global regimes of copyright law and the notion of immaterial property rights. Uh, various immaterial things, from genetic information to folklore, can be commercialized by powerful global actors, and there is popular awareness of such possibilities among ordinary Indonesians. Um, uh, and often one hears them affirming such things as biodiversity or cultural heritage as part of the national wealth. Lorraine Aragon, an anthropologist who worked in uh, the Sulawesi island, has traced this de development and pointed out that uh, uh, the Indonesian copyright law from 2002 extends to the domain of folklore, popular crafts and other things that used to be understood as part of culture. Um, New laws uh, define regional arts as owned by customary communities in cooperation with state oversight. Aragon points out uh, that this is not merely uh, something that protects uh, ordinary people from intellectual piracy by foreign actors. It also means that uh, local government officials become an interested party in registering ownership of cultural works and specifying the political boundaries of groups who should be allowed to, to use and identify with those works. So we have one aspect of uh, a kind of new approach to, to heritage here. Um, the UNESCO World Heritage status is another way in which cultural property is recognized and protected by institutions, this time on a global scale rather than on the national or local scale. The UNESCO draft listing gives the following justification for the world heritage status of the Banda Islands. The Spice Islands, and I quote, are indeed an outstanding example of the earliest conquests in colonial history exhibiting not only remnants of the European occupation, but also the unique natural marine environment that attracted the exploitation of the land." End of quote. One thing that strikes the eye here is that local people or Indonesians do not receive any special attention here. Heritage discourse does, does have a term for the recognizing local people's role as primary voice carriers or having first voice. In other words, people who carry the voice of past generations represent the agency of those who participated in making the monuments and environments that represent some humanly shared past. Amar Vishwar Galla has argued that intangible heritage cannot be dissociated from the knowledge of such people. In practice, primary voice carriers might be understood as people who reside near the monuments. A potential justice issue is how they might benefit from their heritage status in some way rather than just lose their land rights. But resolving this issue becomes even more complicated when some voice carriers actually live somewhere else, as seems to be the case with Banda. In this situation, ownership issues are easily politicized in a way that would be undesirable for UNESCO's mission of guarding world culture. 
I do not think the world heritage status of Banda is in any uh, necessary contradiction with the claims that the Banda Eli people make to Banda. What the descendants of the pre-colonial Bandanese population are asking is that outsiders should recognize them as a cultural group that continues to live on, ideally the voice carriers. Um, and, and this is what the current inhabitants of Banda clearly do when they ask them to perform ancient songs in the rituals that consecrate culturally important sites in Banda. At the same time, one should not pretend that heritage is a purely cultural question uh, that can be resolved by identifying the people and the forms of local knowledge that represent it. Many local groups are involved in the political institutions that seek to define the scale at which cultural property is shared. Banda is an interesting site for developing tourism, something that concerns the provincial government. Therefore, the heritage claims of a Banda have complex ethnic, political and commercial implications. In addition to the global scholarly based discourse of the UNESCO, the Banda heritage is being actively negotiated by various local parties, the people of pre-colonial Bandanese ancestry among them. I uh, began by asking how the local vision of heritage could be translated into cultural heritage practices, uh, which are relevant for the current legal and political situation. Today's Bandanese are active participants in local politics and scholarly debates, and they are certainly interested in negotiating the terms in which they are recognized as stakeholders in Banda heritage. My own research has made clear that they commemorate their Bandanese ancestors, even if late 19th century scholars dismissed their knowledge about how they came to live in the Kay Islands and other remote areas of Maluku. They are also interested in joining public events that draw the attention of the world to Banda and willing to debate how the events of colonial conquest should be interpreted. As a partial answer to my question, I would argue that a holistic approach to cultural empowerment is needed. Now that few people are able to perform the ancestral songs of the Banda community, which I studied in the 1990s, the Banda language is the most prominent living heritage and a reference point for a social identity for these people. Empowering small minority groups to revitalize their local languages rather than just documenting these languages is one condition for helping them to gain recognition in today's world. And that has also been uh, one focus in my most recent ethnographic engagements with the Bandanese in recent years. So I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present. I look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, really enlightening. And also very important to also um, shift our gaze or widen our gaze um, a little bit more and involve also the diaspora, and the Kai Islands. And uh, you've, you've been there for um, a couple of decades now, right? Uh, at the Kai Islands. When, when was your first visit for, for to give us a bit of an idea? My very first visit was 1989. And um, I didn't go as far as Banda Eli village, but I met the Bandanese who were living in the cities. And uh, then I did my actual fieldwork in 1994 through 1996, uh, uh, mostly village-based. And then 19, uh, 2009, I had the opportunity to go back for a lengthier time. And at that time, I stayed mostly in Ambon city. And then after that, I decided I have to go back every year if I can. So I've made an effort to to stay in touch uh, more consistently than than when I was younger. Nice one. That's that's amazing and so nice of both Tamalia and and Timo, both of you um, having uh, have yeah the, these sources of the people themselves, local uh, wisdom that you acquired um, and have followed over the years is uh, is really important. So thank you very much. Um, and we have uh, a little less than 30 minutes left for a hopefully fruitful discussion. And the chat has been uh, filling up already with questions, remarks, people responding. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, but also um, normally what we do is facilitate um, that the first questions um, after um, the talks will come from people from Banda uh, itself. And um, we usually have some designated um, 
respondees for that. Um, uh, but I think they're uh, unavailable right now. But I just wanted to check um, the room, our digital room, if there are other people from Banda um, or from the Banda diaspora who would like to uh, firstly engage and uh, raise some questions. Then I want to give that space first to you. And you can do that via the chat or to uh, via unmuting yourself. Um, and if not, then actually, um, so I'm gonna check the room again. Are there people from the Bandani diaspora or community? Okay, so maybe what I, I think it's interesting to see also if uh, Amalia, Fridas and uh, Timo you want to briefly react, respond, or have, or maybe you have a question for each other. So I want to briefly give give uh, give you some space for that, and then what? Let's go. To, ah. It's a meeting, the Banda Islands meeting. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, Ronald Jenkins. Hi. Could you mute yourself if you're not uh, talking to us necessarily? <laughs> We can hear you. Okay. I guess I wasn't muted. Uh, you, yes, you were. Um, okay, back to the speakers. So, um, Fridas, Timo, um, Tamalia, you have reactions yeah. to other questions, please. Yeah, m maybe I just add a little bit. Um, in Banda, they do not speak the Bahasa Tana the earth language, their, their original language anymore. But in Banda Eli and Banda Elat, they do. And so the Bandanese, they have a saying, if a person from K comes to Banda and speaks the earth language, there is nothing the ancestors won't give. So, you see that there is a very high respect. And Des used to say that from Banda Eli and Banda Ela, they would come to Banda and they would bring their chakaleles and they would also perform. I mean, they've even done that, you know, when Des was still, was alive, yeah. Uh, not just when he, you know, before the war, but even not so long ago. And it, it's quite, uh, it, it's, they they said to me it's, it's very interesting their chakalele it has even more information in it but unfortunately i was not there when they came so I, the times that they came it's more than once uh so it yeah my dream is to go to Bandai, 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 yeah. and find yeah. out more about that mm. if Please. i may may rejoin this um um i believe that there was a survey from the unpati um, I think there is a, a, a team from Unpati to, who made a folkloric survey in the Banda Islands in the 1970s. And one uh, song that they collected at that time was uh, the, the song uh, that was performed at the consecration of the well in Lontor, I believe. And uh, the, the same song is very, very popular in Banda Eli. So uh, the Unaputti version and the Banda Eli version are basically similar and, and it's very well known as a dancing song in, uh, in the Banda Eli community. And people often make reference to these visits to Banda Islands where the Banda Eli people are invited to perform some of these rituals. And so that's clearly a case where they have a common language with uh, mm -hmm. the people in Banda, even though they don't speak the same language in their everyday life, but they have a shared tradition which uh, makes them able to recognize each other. And so you have these kinds of relationships throughout Maluku where people recognize each other for having an interest in the same place. Uh, when you say song, are you referring to the kabata? Um, it might be known as kabata there. Uh, I think... Uh, so, the so like before you can take out the... to bring out the kora kora you have each yes. kora kora has its own kabata and the kabata right. is a song of the past but the present will also add to that song 
Right. So, uh, and the Kabatas are in, well, partly, not completely, in the old language. So it's, it's not really a language that's spoken or understood anymore. The, the Kabata is memorized usually. I mean, yeah, they understand, yeah. but it's not really a living language in Banda yeah. In, yeah. anymore because the Bandanis intermarried with so many people. So there's ka Kabata for the sea and the Kabata on the land. Yeah. I, I, but they have that also on Seram, the big island. I mean, I think that's an old tradition from already long before the massacre because I, I was mm -hmm. in the jungle in Seram for a while and they have their kabatas too. Mm -hmm. yeah. They add the past, but they also add from the present. And sometimes they drop things from the past. They don't, they don't put that in anymore. Yeah. Uh, Lots of people in Seram who also claim uh, some ancestry in the Banda Islands. Oh, yes. You see, uh, in uh, Ratu, the village where I come from, so Ratu is queen. And, it's some, and she, her name was Boyrotan. And you see, at some point, I think in history, there must have been a woman who was a great chieftain. Uh, because the legend is that uh, Boyrotan, she took a handful of earth and she left the Bandas. And all over the Moluccas, you can find places, they'll say Boyrotan was here. So when I was in Seram in the jungle and I met some of the tribes there who, who could not speak Indonesian, uh, in the interior, and so they said, where are you from? And I said to John, they say, Banda. And the moment I said Banda, they said, oh, Boy Kera, uh, uh, sorry, Boy Rotan was here, just like it was yesterday. It was probably a thousand years ago, you know. She was here, they knew Banda, yeah. Yeah. They are figures, and she's also known in the K Islands. She's known in Ambon. She's known uh, in, in Wahai, up the northern part of Sarah, it's you know there was this great figure once. You know they say we our DNA is seventy four percent Polynesian, yeah, and the Polynesians do did allow women to be leaders and to be goddesses, yeah. So we just have this little remnant. There yeah. was once. Boy, yeah. When the Banda Eli people needed construction land in Ambon, they went to the Raja of Amahusu and performed the Boiratan song, Boiratan Timbangtana. And then yeah, uh, Tana, yeah? <laughs> they, they knew that the Raja Amahusu was Boiratan's descendant. Ah, and and uh, one, of the object, ah. one of the objects that I showed, the, the kind of basket that you carry on your back is called Siloi in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in uh, Amahusu and Ngele in, in Banda Eli. But they, they mm -hmm. showed to the Raja that this is uh, this is the means by which Boiratan was measuring the weight of the soil. And ah. so that's why the Raja Amahusu, his clan is called Siloi. So they were able to prove their kinship uh, with him through Banda. Although they were Muslims, he was Christian. And, and he gave them permission to lift land from the sea bottom to, to make a landfill where they built their houses in the southern part of the Ambon city. Oh, that's wonderful. So this whole evening has been worth it. I've heard another story of Boyrata. I must get your email and we must communicate more, if that's okay. all right with you. Of course. It's always lovely to see uh, senior researchers converse about their work and stepping all into all these uh, details. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for uh, letting us witness that. But there's also, of course, many, many questions um, in the chat. Uh, so um, I want to start at the top. Um, one question, which is a question for the whole group, for all of you, uh, very general, but I think it's good to ask this question. How were the Bandanese able to maintain their culture knowing uh, that most were deported or massacred? What was the role or impact of the newly arriving workforce and enslaved people from outside of Banda on Bandanese practices? So can I make a guess? <laughs> because the Bandanis didn't keep records, yeah? Well, it was the women who kept it going. And when women marry, they're often in charge of the culture, of the beliefs and traditions. And what happened was that the people from outside were absorbed 
into it. So, for example, the village of Ratu, there were a lot of Dutch or, or Eurasians living there, and they got swallowed into the Ada too. So, you know, when death came back from exile in 1967, many of the villagers, uh, you know, I mean, Sukarno's economic policies had just devastated it. There was no regular liners anymore. There was no work. The young people all left and the adat was no longer performed because, you know, it's expensive to do upachara buka kampung. And, you know, the korakoras weren't there. They buried the prows or lost them. Some had forgotten their kabatas. So what he did was he went and he helped them to find the kapatas to make again the korakoras. And the last village was Ratu. They couldn't find the kabata. And they finally found a man, Jan de Beauville, in Holland. He was of mixed blood. He had lived in Banda as a boy. His father had been uh, in the Adat. And he himself was a dancer as well. And he had the kabata. And so finally the Banda kabata uh, sorry, the Ratu Kabata could, uh, uh, came back and so the Adat could be revived again. So I think they just absorbed the people from outside. And somehow those women drew them in and kept the Adat going. That's my guess. Yeah. Who wants to weigh in? Uh, can I answer too? I think I agree with the role of women here because we often identify knowledge about history with with uh, some kind of continuous line of men who are able to keep records or keep uh, keep uh, knowledge somehow in themselves but actually uh, cultural continuity here is probably most uh, mostly dependent on people talking about things that are important for them and uh, obviously certain rituals in banda uh, the ability to claim banda as one's home was based on those rituals, which had to be performed according to certain kinds of uh, precepts. And, uh, and so uh, some of the original Bandanese were needed for, for those performances. And uh, there was an active demand for their knowledge. So that's why there was some continuity. But when I uh, tried to look for a continuous narrative about history, I, I couldn't find just one story which everybody would agree with. I would have lots of different points of view which then mm. came together very much through women who, um, um, as Ibu Tamalia just said, uh, marry from one house to another. When women move from one house to another, they bring with them the knowledge which was in their, in their paternal home and they bring that knowledge to the house of their husbands and then they connect it with the knowledge of other people in that house. And so actually it's uh, this Onotani songs, one of their most powerful effects is to represent unity precisely through the knowledge which is in the heads of women and which women perform. And then it's men who give it different kinds of political interpretations. Men have their political differences, they compete. So they claim that there are different kinds of stories and one is more true than the other. But actually, it's the women who represent the continuity here. Thank you both. Um, let's see, there's more questions. Um, one is uh, specifically uh, catered for you. So, Eric Tutuhartu Lewa asks, mentioned a few times that for this Awi was the last Orankaya. Are there no Orankaya anymore or are there still there? Are they still there but not yield uh, or be any traditional power? I'm sorry, you know, your voice uh, was a little bit off. Okay. I um, couldn't really hear, but is the question here? I can read it. They were asking if there are no more Orankaya? No, I just meant, I, I didn't, when I said he was the last Orankaya, I didn't mean there can never again be Orankaya. I meant he's the last one. There might be more, but he's the last one that, you know, in that sense. Um, and usually in Banda, it's, uh, it, it, it can, you know, it can be elected. 
So from all the villages, they can elect an Orankaya. Uh, it's up to the Bandanese. The question was... So I've lost... Nancy, your voice is fading. Can you... Your, your connection is not good. Oh, okay. How about now? Yes, no, it's, no, it's clear. So, yeah, the question was also very concretely, are there any Orankaya right now? I don't think so. Okay, yeah, yeah. So but I it doesn't mean that they can't elect someone to be here. No, no, that's probably clear. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think the question behind the question probably mm -hmm. is who is pushing for some of these issues from a you know position of uh, power or influence, so. But thanks for that question and that answer. Well, Orankaya means the rich man. The one with the money has the power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do we mean when we say Orankaya? Is it only financial wealth or is it also cultural wealth yeah. and the connection between those two? Yeah. Um, okay, so there's also a question about um, uh, someone from Indonesia Chata Ivanchov, um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, as an active heritage involved person in Indonesia, could, could you talk a bit about the status of Bandanese heritage on the UNESCO tentative list, which hasn't been changed since 2015? Uh, what are obstacles, difficulties? Well, um, it's been going on for more than 20 years, trying to get it on the UNESCO list. And actually, one of the difficulties is that it's got so much wealth. So it's got natural heritage, you know, and so natural, uh, how do you say it, wealth, is that, yeah? In nature, but also cultural, uh, you know, also um, built heritage. And so bringing that together and showing a connection, it, it's quite complicated. Mm. It's not that easy. But I think UNESCO actually would like to give it UNESCO heritage status. Um, so it's, it's, it's in their hands, really. Mm, I mean, the one that can bring it to UNESCO is the Ministry of um, Education and Culture. Although, you see, it was a bit complicated because if it's mixed, then it goes to the Ministry of Social Affairs. I don't know if that's still the case, but it, it's a bureaucratically, it is quite complicated. And then they were stuck because they were told by UNESCO representative here at one point, yeah, but you have to show the connection between the culture and the built heritage. And then for a time they were at a loss. But I think if you look at the Chakalele dance, and the, <laughs> there's clearly a connection that culture of healing that arose, yeah? So all this has to be sorted out. But if I'm not mistaken, the Director General for Culture was in Banda for a month in March. So let's see what happens. Yeah, that might be a good sign indeed. Um, and um, he has visited our sessions, but uh, unfortunately not today, but let's see. Um, who, who else wants to weigh in on this question? Maybe Patimo Katine? Well, I, I was making the point that the UNESCO draft uh, declaration doesn't really mention local people at all. And I'm, I'm wondering why it might be the case. I don't have an answer to this. But I, uh, my sense uh, from talking about the Banda history in Maluku is that there are many different kinds of voices about it. And it's possible that the UNESCO wants one clear representative group like you know some kind of indigenous people who stand for the local voice and when they go to the site they find that there are many different voices and they are very often arguing with each other so i've given uh, a, a couple of talks about the banda history and and folklore in indonesian universities and every time there is somebody in the audience who is kind of saying oh you represent the Des Alwi side or you represent the Banda Eli side so there is always the assumption that there is a an argument going on even if there is not really and I'm just wondering if the UNESCO and and maybe the Indonesian authorities who are processing this this uh, like sort of um, this project um, if they are confused about this fact that uh, these are 
these, are, these things are subject to lively discussion and debate in Maluku itself. Well, exactly, and it shouldn't be uh, something that confuses them because I think this is a worldwide practice that there are uh, multi-diverse voices on, on these issues, uh, as, as there should be, right? I guess. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Afridas, I'm checking in with you also. Do you want to weigh in on these questions or you're good? Oh, no, I'm good. But I think one of the complicated things about Banda is that you have this, this Banda, it's... it's uh, also, when we talk about the continuation of culture, or uh, there is this, and the question about how that was preserved, I think we have to take into account that in 1621, there's a cup, and there's, everything had to start building again. And then it's what we call a fermental pool. There's a kind of revitalization of tradition and culture. So there will be little bits of pieces brought to Banda back again. And when we talk about the Orankaya today, it's a different Orankaya than when you compare it to, to, to 16, uh, 1620. Uh, so I think that's, it's, and that makes it fair complicated. Maybe this is also interfering with the whole discussion with, with uh, UNESCO. Uh, but it's, it, at the same time, it should make it more interesting because it's one of the multi-ethnic uh, and, it, and, and it has a, a very unique history of uh, creating new, uh, a, a new, what is it, a new, uh, society uh, which incorporates the whole history and in very, very different parts of of history, and I think uh, and it's it's good and therefore this this kind of discussion also discussion with with UNESCO is important because it learns us to see all the important parts of history. For a long time, we were discussing Banda only as victims, and of course we should look at the agency of people. Uh, which is different than an agency of Indo-Europeans, somebody wrote it in the chat, uh, who are uh, proud on the colonial past. No, so this, is, this is about agency and survival uh, and not being oppressed, which is different than a kind of Tempo Dulu uh, atmosphere. So I think mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's something that's, that's really important to, to get into, this, uh, into the discussion and when we talk about this continuation to see this how did and I think this is this is important when you think about this, the present day culture of of uh, and 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 Banda, is how did it's it's like a phoenix. You know something came out of the ashes, of the massacre and there's of course this agency in the diaspora, but something came out incorporating also this history before and a part of the culture before and that's that makes it more valuable and I think it should that's that could be something that can make it more powerful yeah you're referring to the chat uh, Pafridis yeah. uh, the, uh, there seems to be a key aspect that the Bandanese do not want to be cast as victims but rather focus their narrative on their resistance and resilience maybe there's a parallel with um, in the European uh, in the European community here in the Netherlands who also do not want to be cast as victims after losing their former homeland and instead focus to the more glorious part of their colonial history. And you've basically tried to um, counter that point, right? Just that, that's, that, that's one one of the things, but I think it's it, when it comes to Banda, to see how it's a, like a phoenix coming out of the, of the no, ashes. No, and and that's, that's, I think that's more important because of the... Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, of course, your part in the conversation also refers to the, the Dutch case. So in that sense, uh, it always is relevant. I see Joella uh, raising her hand. So please, Joella. Yes. So thank you so much. Um, I kind of want to tag on to that because we, as a working group uh, Banda of this series, we are also organizing a fundraiser for a, a festival in the Banda Islands to commemorate uh, the history and celebrate the cultural heritage of the Banda Islands. Um, and it actually is called the Rise of Banda. So it really suits with the Phoenix uh, image that uh, you were just uh, referring to. And I would like to invite everyone uh, again to, um, uh, can you see my screen or no? I'm trying to uh, share my, can you share the screen? Ah, hi Lukman. Hello, I'm fine. <laughs> Good. Glad you could join us today. Um, let me see if I can share. 
anyway, I will send the, I will put the link to the fundraiser in the uh, chat. You can share the screen. And yes, I, will, I was trying to find my PowerPoint slide again, but for uh, some reason I was unable to. Otherwise, people check our website uh, oh. where we can also, ah, here we go. Uh, Technology is not uh, helping today. <laughs> not my friend. It's okay. Uh, meanwhile, Pa Lukman has uh, joined. I'm stopping my share. This is not going according to plan. I will uh, <laughs> share the link in the in the chat. <laughs> Okay, great. That that's a good idea. How are you doing, Palukman? Um, me? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, now I'm a shop in Bandanaira, the Nike. Okay. Yeah. Good. How uh, are you doing there? Yeah. Um, sorry, <laughs> too late here. Um, it's almost midnight here, and. Well, it's great that we can see Banda through you, through your share and through your eyes uh, for a minute. And thank you also for sharing the music yeah. recording with us. Yeah, okay, you're welcome. And maybe I can share uh, my link into, to Juela. I put the all uh, movies and uh, song and the picture about Banda. And maybe Juela can share for you all in the group. Absolutely. Yeah. She will totally take care yes. of that. So, yeah. uh, that maybe is a good bridge for next week. Next yeah. week we will be showing a video that uh, Lukman has created, a short documentary about the Banda Islands through the uh, through a, through local perspective. Lukman has been working really hard on this. Um, so next week we will have a screening of his documentary. Uh, besides the next speakers, yes. Uh, but before we announce uh, next week's uh, program, I um, want to uh, wrap up nicely and uh, also thank our three speakers because it was a very wonderful and rich um, conversation. Uh, thanks to you three. So um, thank you, um, Ibu Tamalia, Ali Shabana, uh, Pafrida Stijlen and uh, Professor Timo Katinen. Um, and uh, for your contributions and for your lively um, um, conversations and uh, for your love of Banda because clearly it must be somewhere um, it ha must ha you know that it has to do with love when you do the, the research you do um, and uh, we look forward to more um, and indeed um, so round of applause and indeed our last, uh, well, not necessarily last, but our fourth session um, is going to be on April 21, um, the same time. Um, and uh, it will focus on arts and public engagement with uh, speakers uh, Beatrice Glow from um, our Banda Working Group, Isabel Bone and Sadia Bonsa, and it will be um, moderated by Wim Manuhutu. And of course, we will then also have, um, Joella mentioned it already, a special online screening of new video work by Bandanese visual artist Lukman Ang, or Lukman, uh, you have an artist name as well, right? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, and we just saw you for a minute. Uh, we really look forward to your work, uh, Pa Lukman. Uh, very excited to see that work. Um, so yeah, I want to thank everyone for being with us. And thank you again for such engaged questions, chatting, um, weighing in. And uh, it's just amazing how um, well attended and how um, involved people are. And also coming from different continents, different time zones but uh, a community nonetheless um, with love for Banda. Thank you all so much and see you next time. Bye everyone.